everybody. How's it going? Uh, afternoon, evening, or whatever it is where you are. Morning? Is it morning somewhere? It's morning. Yes, Australia it's morning. So any of my Australian friends, good morning. G'day. It's my terrible Australian accent. Um, all right, so today, just before we get started, I'm going to talk a little bit about my video that I posted uh, on oh, Saturday, Saturday morning which uh, a lot of people really seem to be really uh, uh, excited about, or the, the topic. We'll talk about that, that in a little bit. But I've got two things on sale today. I've got my guitar reference guide. That's 15% off, the guitar reference guide. If you do not have it, I highly recommend it. It's, uh, it, it's a compendium of scales, uh, arpeggios, triads, all the things I think you need to know. It is not a method book. It's really just a reference guide, which is, I think, really kind of cool. I want to learn my triads. Just go over to the page of triads, and there's all your triads. Um, I also wrote it out in, in the way that I think is most important. When I give you, say, your arpeggios, I give you all the fingerings and the, why they are, like building them. I don't give them to you in every key because that's not good teaching. <laughs> if you ask me, like, here's all your arpeggios in all 12 keys, you'll never learn it. You know, right? But if you learn it in one key, starting off in the key of C maybe, um, you really start to see how the chords interact with each other or what the difference is between each kind of chord voicing or chord type and it starts to internalize it. So I think that that's a really important way to go. Uh, the other thing that's on sale with 40% off, a whopping 40% off is my Blues Rock Masters course that I had done with Brett Pop a little while ago. Um, so I want to throw that on there for today if nobody has that. It's 40% off. That's where I talk about Jeff Beck, Eric Clapton, uh, Jimmy Page, and David Gilmore. Um, I like that course. I like all my courses. I like those two. So I'll give you a course on sale and the Guitar Survival Guide. All right, so thanks everybody who's here, and thank you, of course, for BV always uh, uh, helping out the man, the myth, the legend. The... Someday we'll meet, which would be kind of cool. Different country. All right, so if any of you guys saw my video from Saturday, uh, it was interesting. I'll just talk a little bit about the backdoor YouTube stuff. I originally, originally called the, the video Creativity is Making Mistakes, and it didn't do very well, and I changed the title to two things every guitar player must know or something like that. And then suddenly it's one of my top videos in that time period. So a little funny thing about how YouTube and algorithms work that uh, my audience was like, oh, guitar. Also I'll talk a little bit about the Robin Williams video that I did where I worked on the movie August Rush. We can talk a little bit about that, answer questions about that too. Cause it's been, a, uh, I like to talk about the video I'd done the week previously, but I didn't do a, a feed last week. Okay, so let's talk about the one first. There's two things that I, that I think are the most important things when you practice guitar or things that people don't talk about enough. I can talk about practicing guitars, like, um, you know, uh, practice your arpeggios and practice your scales and practice these things and those things. And that's, that's important and uh, a big deal. But what's really, really important is that you need to learn how to practice uh, being creative. And that's a big thing that I didn't do for a really long time. Just kind of experimented on the guitar to where it was fun, you know, um, just play and just play and play. So to do that, you need to do a number of things. I wrote a little few notes. Um, the first thing you need to really do is um, put aside, if you have the time, you have to make the time to practice. So we have this practicing, we make time to practice playing scales, all the things I'm talking about. But we need to make time to practice improvising and being creative. Because that's not going to happen just because you know your scales or you know the thing that you're supposed to use to improvise doesn't mean you're going to improvise well. All right. So, um, so for instance, let me just kind of give you an example. I'm just going to lay down a little G minor groove, right? And my looper. that sound, right? That E. So, and try to play that up. That's our natural six. But say you're messing along, right? And playing. I'm, using, I'm playing in Dorian. G Dorian. Right? So I'm just going to mess around with that and see what sounds I come across that I like. Natural six, that's the key kind of sound for Dory. So I'm going to play around that. Mm -hmm. 
So as I'm kind of going through this, just improvising freely, I'm coming up with some of these ideas, right? Right, just kind of go through these sounds. And just spend time just improvising, because that's where I'm going to come up with something that I may not have come up with before. I'm not playing licks, right? I'm not thinking about, uh, you know, something like that, like a blues lick. I'm trying to avoid that. I'm just trying to experiment and not to try to judge what it is I'm going to play. If I make a mistake, well, I make a mistake. And as I said in the video uh, the other day, you can do this at any level of how any level of where you are along in your playing is what I mean. Um, look, if you're just starting and you know a three chords, you know, no, you're gonna, you know, you're not gonna have a lot of fun improvising and, and experimenting like that. You're just not. You're, you don't have enough under your belt yet. So let's just be honest. You know, you're just starting. This could prove to be very, very frustrating. <laughs> but if you are excited about uh, coming up with some different ideas and understanding how the guitar works and just kind of feeling like, you know, what when you listen to somebody play, how do you how do they come up with this stuff? Like, is it just kind of popping into their head? And I want to talk about a few myths and I'm putting together some videos on guitar myths, you know. But the first one is that this stuff comes out of nowhere. Creativity comes out of nowhere. People just pick up the guitar. I used a, that video from John Schofield, Improvising on a Blues, and it's one of the greatest things ever. If you go to the video, which um, you can see what I'm talking about, I put the link on that in the last video. Um, it's not that you haven't done this before. It, this is something that you've practiced and worked on. And the time to get these ideas together is on, in your house, right? Or when you're kind of looping on something like this. So um, when I have a mistake, and what's a mistake? Well, you know, you, you, you missed an idea, uh, you went for something, or you just kind of fumbled, and it turned out to be maybe something kind of good. Um, are there wrong notes? There's all these cliches like, Oh, there's no such thing as wrong notes. Yeah, there's a there is such a thing as wrong notes. Of course there are. Right? Or, you know. Like, you know, if I, what, what do I mean by right or wrong note? You know, what that cliche, that term like there are wrong no wrong notes in music. And then the other half of that is usually just poor choices. What that really means, just I want to clear that one up, because a lot of people when I did the video, they're like, there are no wrong notes, blah, 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 and people talking about this. And I know some people were half joking, but it's a cliche we hear quite a bit in music. And it, it really more comes down to improvising when you're adding in sort of chromatic notes, you're trying to go for something, and how you try to make something has to work in the idea of a line or a phrase. But if I just hit a bad note, ah, that's a wrong note. Right, so that some people take that literally. Oh, there are no wrong notes. Yeah, there are. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely wrong. I'm playing a G minor chord, and I nail an A flat. It's it's a wrong note. But if I use it, you know, as a passing note, then it's not a wrong note. But so I just want to clear that up. You know, there are no wrong notes. But in the context, maybe of you resolving to something that sounds tonal, then that that I think you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Sometimes if it sounds like a wrong note, it's a wrong note. You know, it's a bad note. But if you mix it into a line and somehow resolve it properly, legitimately and musically, then it wasn't a wrong note. Okay, so that's one of my little pet peeves. <laughs> so, um, so the thing about this is that I've, the, the next thing is, or the first thing we're going to sit down and I'm just going to play over something, whether it's a blues and just focus in on just experimenting with one, maybe one idea. I was just playing with Dorian and just seeing what kind of happened. If it's just pentatonic, sure. Because there's a few little quotes that I've put together um, and I'm going to pull up on the screen in a minute that were kind of cool that relate to this. So most people who are into exploring what creativity is, um, which I like to do because I like to think of myself as a creative person. Pretty much everyone says the same thing. You need to put aside lots of time. And that's the most difficult part for me as well. I've got work, you know, I've got to make videos, uh, I've got to teach, um, I've got a family, you know, all those things. I have to make a living, so I can't suddenly go, well, I'm going to practice for five hours today. I mean, fortunately, some days I can do that, but not every day. But so I need to put aside a certain period of time every time I get up in the morning and try to put aside this place where I can even improvise for 
and work on stuff for at least an hour, at least. Now, I, I was talking about John Cleese's book, and somebody mentioned maybe doing an English accent, which is, I can't do one. I wish I had my brother on here. He does a great sk- Scottish, and he does a great English accent, too. I can't do accents at all. Anyway, so John book, Cleese's book on creativity basically says the same thing. You know, you need hours of uninterrupted time. And there's been studies... Uh, how long it takes you to get back into the zone or back to your concentration after you've been interrupted. It could be an interruption of like your phone or, or it could be somebody, you know, walking down the stairs and you're like, ah, oh, you, so you want to try to clear out your space as best as you can. The biggest stressors I find for me is this freaking thing, you know, like it, bing, it goes off and even like, you know, they set it up so it's really hard to turn it off. Like I'm like my computer, if I'm jamming along with something or a track and trying to come up with something. Even if I turn off my messages, I, what, they still pop up in the corner of the screen and you're like just distracted and you lose your thing, your train of thought for a minute. Okay, so I would just say to put aside the time, try to turn everything off and to work on one idea. So like I said, I'm just thinking Dorian here, you know. So, and maybe a position. Okay, I'm going to listen to those sounds. Flat three. That's the nine. Okay, now let's talk about that for a second. <coughs> when you first hear it like... So this is the, the flat three, which is B flat, to the nine, which is the, the two, which is A, to the G. So when I hear that in the context of a line, perfect, it's a root. Flat three, but then the nine, or two... Didn't you want to hear it go, or, but if you listen to it more and more and kind of get that sound in your head, the nine more and more feels like a useful and a good note for me. See, there was a mistake. <laughs> I, I love that. Right, so. So by just kind of practicing and exploring each of these notes, I'm talking about practicing here too, but being creative. Okay, and go down just a scale. That's awesome. The fourth. So out of the scale, to me the fourth is the weakest. So let's hear that. So chord tones, flat three. Beautiful. And then my nine. Love that sound. Root. Killer. Maybe a little bit boring after a while. Flat seven. Part of the chord. And then my six, my natural six. For Dorian. My five of the chord. Part of the chord. The four of the scale. Yeah. That usually wants to go up to the five or down to the flat three the most to me. Two, which is the nine again. Then you start to experiment, think, well, if I play the nine down low. When I hear a nine, sometimes the nine works register-wise for me. Just as we go through this, you're like, how come it sounds cool up top, but it doesn't sound as good down low? Sometimes the lower notes uh, start to get into the register of the bass. <laughs> to me, they feel like they need to. Sometimes those extensions on the chords sound better higher up. Okay, so, right? So I'm going to resolve that. I can still use it, but I'm going to resolve it. All right, so it's going to keep on messing around. Now, if I start kind of come up with a phrase. I talked about this in my last master class and on the last workshop here, last live feed, excuse me. Rhythmic ideas. So I'm just exploring. Right, just exploring the idea and the sound of Dory and a, a rhythmic phrase. Right? 
so these things start to kind of come out the more you do it. I've been doing it for a really, really long time. So what I also said in the previous, in the, the video that came out on the weekend, was what I'm working through too is putting into effect or usage the things that I already know how to do. So I know Dorian, but I may not have ever played that before. And the only way you're going to come up with some of these ideas is if you just experiment. Um, Tim Pierce, the good friend of mine, I remember talking to Tim about this on those videos that he does. Um, where he plays amazingly on everything, of course. But Tim was talking about, oh yeah, I play over for a really long time. And um, sometimes I come up with a really cool line that I've worked out. Other times I just kind of improvise on this stuff, but it's never really cold, right? You don't, he just doesn't go, let's go. So I've played over this before, but I may not have ever played over this way exactly, if that makes sense. So when we talk about the idea of improv and improvisation, a lot of it comes through memorization. And you can't expect, because you practice your scales or you learned other people's solos, so when you start to improvise that, that's how it comes out and it just flows freely and you sound great. It, unfortunately, it just doesn't work that way at all. It works exactly like what I'm talking about. Anybody who you hear play who's like a badass, they've done this. They've taken the time and they've worked on each sort of idea, play over a tune. Um, this is one of the, this is kind of funny. Um, I took a lesson many years ago from Wayne Krantz, who uh, uh, I haven't I haven't seen Wayne in years. Actually, he moved I think. But um, anyway, so if you guys aren't familiar with Wayne Krantz, an amazing guitar player, I would play the Fifty Five Bar on Friday nights. He was there on Thursdays, and just an amazing guitar player. So I took a lesson with him because he's completely different than uh, me. And I I had played him some of the stuff from a new record we had done, my band at the time called Liquid Hips, and. Uh, like, yeah, I'm just trying to think about new stuff. I feel like I'm always playing the same stuff on my songs. And he said, well, do you, do you practice playing over the songs? And I was like, no. <laughs> That's like the most obvious answer in the whole world, right? I, don't, I didn't practice working on the songs. And how absolutely ridiculous is that, that I wouldn't work on uh, the song I'm working on. So ever since then, I think, yeah, that's right. That's my guitar polish is in the camera there. It's like, how ridiculous is that? So my idea to get across to you is anything I want to work on, I need to have spent some time working on it and practicing it and playing over it for me to kind of tap into the creative ideas that I can come up with if I want to solo on that. If I'm trying to write tunes, it's the same thing. Actually, I find that to be much more difficult. You have to take the time, sit down, and expect nothing to come out of it. And a lot of times, um, something good comes out of, out of nothing over time. I mean, sometimes you get that thing, like I think the Bee Gees talked about the Staying Alive, they wrote it almost immediately. And there are songs that probably come out like that. I'm thinking of like a big hit. I remember them talking about that, that that song was written almost as quickly as it, it was finished almost as quickly as it was written. And then there's songs that come out, it took a really long time for people to talk about it or to, to figure out. And I've talked about Paul McCartney. He was on Howard Stern talking about this. He's got all these ideas on his phone. Every day he sits down, tries to write new songs, takes lots of time. In Cleese's book, he said the same thing, that often he'll have these periods where nothing comes out, but the next day, it was like that working up period that your brain does. Um, like things, you ever notice that? Like I, I do this with my courses. I have an idea of what I want, and I kind of struggle for weeks, and I don't know, and then suddenly the whole thing starts to kind of come out in my head because that whole time I was thinking about how I can make the course and what, what's going to be interesting on the course. Okay. Um, hope this is making sense. Hope this isn't boring. But to me, this is really, really kind of cool, important stuff. And the other thing I was going to say uh, on this is mistakes. Mistakes are really important to make. Um, so let's talk about mistakes to say if you want to be an improviser. Um, if I'm going to play a little more out, like, you know, sometimes I make mistakes playing Doran, not as much. But so I want to be more chromatic, like... that work okay let's say uh, flat five so I'm gonna try to get my way out of the corner like so I'm gonna hit the flat five is a good note but we we'll hit natural third see that was a bad note here's a natural third I made a mistake then that to me was just a mistake now watch flat five Natural third, maybe natural third. 
So I get, I get practice getting. That's a terrible note on the minor seven chord, but. So I will sometimes start to mess with that natural third to see if I accidentally hit it, if I can somehow get myself out of that corner I painted myself into. And I, I would do this a lot, just set up a jam track. This is just a loop and just going through it and then see like, oh man, this is, this is terrible or this is great, you know? Um, and then try to get myself out of that corner that I may or may not have painted myself into. All right. So, okay, cool. So a few little quotes here. Is this exciting to people? I see some people are dropping out. Some people are like, oh, this is really boring. Play some more guitar. Talk about blues. <laughs> I don't know. Let me know in the, in, the, in the chat here. All right. Here's my PDF. Here we go. All right. difficult in my mind. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I, I compare myself to everyone. I beat myself up all the time about not being good enough. You know, when you've got, I don't think I'm a bad guitar player. I'm not going to give you some sort of BS false modesty thing. You know, I know I'm a good guitar player. Uh, I think it took me a while to tap into my talent on the instrument or my strengths. Um, I'm not saying I was never not good, but for me, it was always, always, always about working really hard. Um, I'm not, I never thought I was a natural, whatever that means, but you know what I'm saying? Like you got, like my, got some friends I've got, uh, that just pick up and you, they play or they've always been kind of better than you. It took me a while to figure it out and it came from working really hard. So the self-doubt is still there. And of course, things across my career have brought my confidence levels up. I think most notably, the past few years with Robin and such, but you know, getting hired for gigs or just you know, the the um, acceptance by some of your peers, things like that. You know, being invited to sit in, you're like, oh, I, I guess I'm actually not that bad. And but I still, it, I still get self-crushing doubt, and that's usually when I just screw up. And this is what I mentioned in the other video. It's like when you're on stage and you're performing, you're like, yeah, yeah, I sound pretty good, and then suddenly pfft, you just it all falls to the ground and you, you got out of that moment, you thought about it, or if you think to yourself, oh man, I sound terrible tonight. Sometimes you can get into that swirling thing and I can sometimes get into that. If things aren't feeling right or your, your tone's not right or something, you know, sometimes I really just start to go in a bit of a spiral and I, don't, I, I hate when I do that. you're not taking chances, it's just boring. You're not going to come up with anything. So let me talk about, I think Rick Beato just did a video on Jeff Beck and that's one of my, my favorite guitar player. What I love about him is when I never can really predict what he's going to play next. There's, it just seems like whatever he's thinking comes out. Um, and Oh, the quotes kill the audio. Oh, thanks. Okay, guys. Awesome. I didn't know that. Thank you. All right. I'll read them again. I, oh, I see. I didn't. Yeah, you see. Hold on, I think I can do that. 
I can do that while I'm talking to you. Plus, oh, what an idiot. Hold on. Quotes kill audio. Okay, I'm going to go back. There's my audio. Thank you so much. Okay. I'm going to go back over some of these. See, it's a one-man show, guys. Thanks. All right. Don't wait for inspiration. Inspiration comes what comes while working. As I was saying before, it's really important that when you're playing and practicing that you are working on things. It doesn't come by just sitting around doing nothing. And inspiration doesn't come from like me sitting on the couch. It comes from me uh, working on stuff. Yep. Go back over some of these. Okay. See? There's my voice. Yes. Thank you. So, thanks, guys. You know, you set these things up and you try. Okay. Next thing. The worst enemy to creativity is self-doubt. I think you guys got that one. All right. So the next one. Here we go. You can be cautious or you can be creative, but there's no such thing as cautious creative. That one's a big one to me. Um, because I, if you're not working on it, right, um, at the time, it ain't gonna, if you, it, we're talking about Jeff Beck for a second, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So Rick Beato did a, a video on Jeff Beck, and he's absolutely my favorite guitar player um, of all time. And what I love about him is that you can tell he's just going for it. And I've seen him make mistakes, whatever that means. Like, sometimes he just doesn't make what he's going for on those rare occasions. I've mentioned it before, I keep on talking about Robin, but that experience of someone who just takes chances and he just goes for it, especially live and improvising, just going for it, see what happens. Um, Hendrix, perfect example. You know, Del Hendrix was totally seat of the pants, right? He was just going for that stuff. That's the most exciting thing for me um, is when I see somebody who does that. And I, I, I don't like going to shows necessarily where um, someone is playing things exactly like the record. Now, there's certain things that are like that. Say, like, you know, if you, I saw Roger Waters the other night, and, you know, you want to hear the solos from the records because those are part of the compositions, and if I'm seeing him play, uh, you know, Sheep or Dogs or something like that, and I want to hear the solos from the record because that's they're, they're compositions. I'm talking about improvisation. But, um, so, yeah. So, this is, the, I think, the point here is that you need to be not cautious. And don't forget, like, nobody's getting hurt. It's not like you're... This is just you playing guitar. And that's where the self-doubt comes in. So you got to just, it all comes together here, guys. If you practice this stuff at home and you practice just doing stuff on your own and playing without too much self-doubt and without editing yourself as you go along, it becomes more fun. And then you've kind of practiced some of that idea. So if you get on a stage, or you get jamming with your friends, you are more, um, you have more, uh, confidence in throwing out these creative ideas. Does that make sense, right? You're more like, wow, I can I kind of worked on this, so I know if I do something kind of nutty, I might pull it off, I'm, but I need to just throw that caution to the wind. And the more back-end practice you're doing on that, the more confident you can be that that will come out. Okay. Next one. All right, this one I like a lot uh, by Ursula K. Le Guin, author of Lathe of Heaven, which is one of my favorite sci-fi books. I see Angus Clark's on here, right? Angus, great book, Lathe of Heaven. Uh, the creative adult is the child who survived. Yeah, yeah, a little kind of heavy, but it sounds great, right? It's totally cool that, you know, I, I mentioned in the, in the video, I have a, a son, and especially when he was a little kid, when little kids play, they're just going nuts. They don't care about, they'll just do anything. They play with this kind of reckless abandon. And if you can kind of, if you can get to a point when you're playing that you do that, and this requires a lot of comfort level, though, right? It requires some confidence in your skills. It requires that you've kind of practiced this a bit at home. It requires that you like the guys in the band, that you feel like they're going to go with you. Because if you're going crazy and the rest of the guys are just not following you, that can be um, a little bit daunting. So these are not things like overnight, but these are goals. But you can start practicing them at any, at any level. All right. Next one. I'm almost done with the quotes. Great things are done by a series of small things brought together. This is huge, 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 huge. Um, you know, if I'm talking about this kind of vamp here again. Right? Okay, then watch now. How about, how about this? Like that blues like so. 
I put in a blues link, but I kind of thought like, oh, that's two ideas at once, right? So this is kind of more intervallic. Intervallic thing again. Blues lick. So I get kind of comfortable with mixing these two ideas together. So the smaller idea put along with another small idea mixes these bigger ideas. I talked a little bit about that um, the other week on that terminology that a lot of jazz musicians use called cells, like these four note, four note ideas or one bar ideas, and you start to piece that one bar idea with this other bar idea, and then suddenly you have a two bar idea that's longer, and then you put another one there, and, or you put the first one as the different one, then you repeat the first one. So you start to expand upon these ideas by working on smaller ones. And that's really inspiring for creativity to me as well. Um, and is that that one? Was it? Oh, and uh, Dorothy Parker. I can't get this on the screen. Okay. For some reason. Uh, creativity is a wild mind and a disciplined eye. I like that one. I got, I can't, I got a, somehow my program's not showing the bottom. So I like that one too. Once more again, I'll read it to you. Creativity is a wild mind and a disciplined eye. I like that. I like that one a lot because you you got to be disciplined to do this stuff and anybody who's a badass at anything they do has worked really hard at it. But you have to also remember that you have to practice at having fun and being creative with it. And I think that that's kind of cool. All right. So that was a lot of blabbing. At least you got some questions. Take a look here. Um, all right. Oh my gosh, I keep on getting text here. It's making me crazy. I'm getting Keith Williams texting about a joint text with Keith. <laughs> Keeps on coming up my phone and my screen, which is hysterical. All right. Um, all right, say so everybody, you know, Phil Jones, we got uh, My Knees Hurt here, David Truxell, Stephen Moore, Jason Carter. All the usually Al Dolson, um, David Cromwell, everybody's here as always. Okay, looking sharp, thanks. Up in the game, I'm glad you guys noticed. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Steve Moore, why? Well, didn't we cover this in our last lesson? Yeah, sometimes Steve and I work together, and uh, yeah, a lot of kind of these sort of things, you know? It's improvising. Um, Okay, there's a good thing. Jason Carter, I had a friend who could play every song and every famous solo on the guitar. He couldn't improvise to save his life, though. A fine balance. It's absolutely true. It's absolutely true that, you know, learning other people's solos uh, is important at some point. And I still go back and learn. I don't learn maybe somebody's whole solos at this point in my career. I'll just learn a section and then like a lick that I really like or something that really jumps out at me. Um, I will learn other people's solos for ideas or vocabulary or um, something that they're doing that I just want to learn how it's done. Um, but I do recommend, especially if you're just getting into playing uh, and you want to get into a style, like say if I want to learn how to play bebop, well, then I highly recommend for me to learn bebop solos. You know, learn, learn some Charlie Parker or Wes Montgomery or, you know, that get that vocabulary together because that's the vocabulary of that music, which I don't have. So if I want to be a better jazz guitar player, I know the answer for me is to actually transcribe other people's work. Excuse me. I've done that with blues and rock and, and jazz and fusion and things. It's very helpful. But the last thing I try to do is to play their solo verbatim because that's a really bad idea. Because um, first of all, nobody wants to hear it. And if you did like me, like I remember like one of my recitals in college, I tried to play this Mike Stern tune. I tried to play his guitar solo and I just lost my spot in a solo and I lost confidence. And then I was out the window because I was trying to copy something that was his. It was stupid. So that was like those lessons learned. I remember my teacher like, why are you playing his solo? It's just, that song's not that hard. Why didn't you do your own? Because I didn't have the confidence, but um, so I didn't do the back end work, right? I didn't play over it enough. I didn't do the things, all the stuff I'm kind of talking about. Um, Michael Cope, you want me to dig into the accents. I, I shall not embarrass myself by doing accents today. I cannot, I terrible at accents, can't do them. Hey, Zeta's here, what's up Zeta? Matt Gibson, what's going on? Um, this loop is just one chord right now. Um, yes, it is. The, the loop um, is actually I'm playing G minor seven to F, to D seven, excuse me. Right? It's supposed to go in. That's kind of boring. And a lot of times in jazz, if you're going to vamp on one chord, that's pretty common. Down vamping on a minor chord to a five. Because actually, that opens up some sonic abilities, comp you know, things. I can 
get into playing that D chord if I want. But that's another lesson. So yeah, that, that just makes it more interesting. I'm just playing G minor seven to D seven. Um, learn how to play, okay, this is a uh, Igor, uh, um, or Igor. <laughs> learn how to combine lead and rhythm at the same time? Question. Um, is ideal for jam and jam in his bedroom? Yeah, sure, of course. So, yeah, you always want to do that. So, like... Right? You can slow down. So you start to take a little, a little shorter idea, like one bar or two bars. That's definitely a cool thing to do. That's almost like a different thing to practice. But yes, of course, anything like that, anything you practice with intent is going to be good, as long as it's not nonsense. Like I'm going to practice something ridiculous, you know. I shouldn't say, uh, no, it's G minor 7 to D7. D as in dog. So um, I'm playing G... G Dorian over the top of that. That does not address the D7, which has an F sharp. So if I was doing the F sharp and changed it, right? Um, well, the D7, oh, okay, but Richard, Richard's saying D7 is out of A Dorian. Okay, without getting too deep into it, it's just a way to make it more interesting, right? But what I end up playing at that point, if I want the scale, but I don't think it scales on this, is um, G melodic minor, which actually has a D7 in it. So that's uh, D is, is G melodic minor. Let's hear it. All right. Right? That's G melodic minor. But more easily, it's just you have a D chord in there. That's another lesson. But it, just to give you the answer, it would be G melodic minor. Um, I wish I could mess around and sound this good. Well, you know, Jason, well, thank you very much, Jason. Um, it's, uh, it didn't happen, I don't mean this in any way, I just worked really freaking hard at it. That's it, you know, like, that's one thing I can say, at least with guitar, I mean, I look, okay, there's my self-doubt. I look at other people who practice way more than me, and that makes, gives me, like, I should practice more, you know. I should be doing this, or like, oh, here's one. And this is a, an interesting thing. I'm a little stream of consciousness, but all these self-doubt things. Like I listen to someone like, um, you know, my friend uh, Ben Yunson, who was on my, he was joining me when he was playing, when, during COVID, when I did the lockdowns on the Saturday morning with interviews. Check out Ben, ridiculous guitar player, this monstrous technique, like, you know, very harmonically advanced. And I, I think to myself, man, I would love to be able to, to play like that, yeah, you know, and I think to myself, like, no, I wouldn't, because if I were really loved that for me, if that's the way I heard music, I would have probably worked on that, if that makes sense. And it's not, it's not certainly attracting from that's the way he hears music. For me, I don't hear music that way. My favorite guitar players don't play that way. When I naturally play, I hope I, I'm. I'm more of like a melodic player. I've got plenty of chops, but I, I'm always drawn towards the super melodic guys. Not that I love Alan Haldsworth. I'm not saying he's not melodic, but I, if you see what I'm kind of saying, that, you know, oh, like jazz. I, you know, I should learn how to play jazz. Well, why? I don't love it, honestly. I don't love bebop. I just don't. And I don't love bebop guitar. I respect the people who play it and all that kind of stuff. But for me... I like a little overdrive, I like bent notes, I like the sound of a Strat or a Les Paul, or you know what I mean, through a semi-distorted amp or a distorted amp. That's what I love. That's what I grew up with, and that's my favorite kind of sound. So I could say I want to play jazz, you know, but that doesn't mean that, to so that self-doubt of like, oh, I should be better at jazz. It's like, well, why? I mean, you don't love it, so why don't you just get better at what you love? Which also brings me to some other thoughts. Here's my random thoughts. Like, some people say, oh, you know, you should work on your weaknesses. And I'm a, a disagreement on that. I think you should work on your strengths. 
because those are the ones that are going to make you unique. I mean, there's standard, um, there's standard technique you should, you need to have as any musician. You need to be able to kind of play your, your acts. That's it. Like there's no, to whatever level that's up to you. So this talks about technique in a way. So like, let's talk about David Gilmore again. Does David Gilmore have a great technique? To play the music that he does, he has the best technique. Does Jeff Beck have great technique? Absolutely. But does he have technique like Pat Metheny? Absolutely not. So you see what I'm getting at here, that like great technique often just refers to how well you play what it is that you play. So what I work on is technique that is within the realm of things I like to hear. Now, I do try to push myself with physical technique because sometimes I wish I could play faster or cleaner um, or a little longer melodic lines, you know, just, just better technique that I can rely upon, have some more headroom when I'm on a gig so I don't kind of fumble a bit. Yeah. But when I listen to someone like Alan Hallsworth, in my mind, I'd love to play like that, but there's no way I'm going to be able to. So when I talk about someone like my friend Ben, who's got this outstanding technique with this legato stuff and his vocabulary, I don't even play music where that, you know, would fall into something that I would think would be appropriate for that. Maybe he can, um, if that all makes sense. So now I'm trying to get to this point when I look at someone who's got technique, technique, I just go, man, that's awesome. Listen to that guy. That is so killer that they can do that and just go, you know, just accept it that that's not my bag and I'm gravitating towards my bag. So in terms of finding my strengths for me, I felt like it was always more melodic and I kind of just dug deeper into that. Um, so that's what I mean. I don't mean like don't work on if you've got, if you can't get your pentatonic scale clean. That that's to me is a given. What I mean by strengths is my strengths and, and I go for what I love. Okay. Um, big picture, you want to work on your game, uh, complete, you know, your game complete strengths and weaknesses. Yes, yes. But I think you understand what I'm trying to say about the weaknesses part. Like a weakness for me is bebop. Do I, but the question is, do I really, really want to play bebop? And the answer to that would be no, because if I did, I would have worked on it. That's my kind of my point. But we beat ourselves up by saying, I should be better at this, this, and this. And everybody, somebody, one person cannot be great at all of it. I defy you to say, to find someone who is as good as a rock guitar player as Eddie Van Halen and as good as a jazz player as Wes Montgomery. You know what I'm saying? Like, they don't exist. People start throwing out names of these amazing guitar players who can cover a lot of styles. But they would say, yeah, but I'm not Eddie or I'm not Wes. So I'm not, you know, so I think the people who are the best at their thing are the guys who focus in on their thing. There's courses people who can play lots of different styles, and I don't mean that, but, you know, Jeff Beck's the best. I play rock guitar pretty darn well, I think. Don't play like Jeff Beck, though, you know. I can play some, I can play some jazz, but I won't play jazz like Wes Montgomery, or, you know. <laughs> so that's my point. All right. Okay. Okay. There's me blab. Okay. So Angus. Okay. Uh, it's like an ear training exercise where you identify the intervals emotionally rather than clinically or technically. It's freeing. Absolutely. Angus Clark, personal friend of mine. Um, Angus, go check him out. Coming up on the latest Trans-Siberian Orchestra tour on the West Coast. If you go to angusclark.com, I believe, or angusclark.net, I think. Like that. Well, I'm sorry, Angus. Can't remember. You'll have his tour schedule. Definitely go see him. He's the, he's the man. Um, you know, and so it, it's really, and all it's, get, it's really just getting you, as BV says right here, is getting, it's about fretboard knowledge, getting friendly with all those things, your triads, your intervals. Absolutely. Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Andy Timmons talks about intellectual and, and oral lectual concepts, i.e. that you've already learned that when your ear, it takes you where you want to. Yes, you have to practice it. So a lot of times people ask me like, oh, what are you, are you thinking about chord tones or when you're soloing or are you thinking about like when you're rip? No, it's just like when I'm speaking to you, I don't think about how I spell the word the, you know, if you practice enough speaking, music is a language, sounds like a cliche, but it completely is. And the more fluent you become in a part of a language, just the more you are able to speak fluently in that language. So you can start using bigger words in your vocabulary. And that's kind of what I work on. So it's always important to push yourself to get some new stuff in there, or else you can kind of stagnate. But I'm always trying to find some new vocabulary for my playing. And in that, in, funny though, and in doing that, um, 
you uh, really, that's where you come up with the new ideas too, but you just kind of start pushing yourself and you're like, or, um, you know, if you're working on a lick by somebody that's very difficult and after a while you just kind of forget what it is, but you keep the germ of what was so cool about the idea. All right. Um, oh yeah, go over to Angus Clark's, uh, thanks BB for putting up Angus's uh, YouTube page. There's a video of him playing a solo from Kitaro. Go over there and like his page and listen to that one. Subscribe to my buddy Angus, he's the best. Um, okay. What's going on here? All great stuff, fascinating, good. You're loving it, you guys, I'm so far behind this. Okay, glad you guys are digging this stuff. Um, and sorry about the, uh, the, the audio was gone there. Um, that's how far behind these, these things are here. Um, okay. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just, uh, thanks. Thanks, Beaver, for putting all the stuff out here. Just looking at the questions. Uh, got your starry eyed. Keith's late tonight. Is Keith here? I don't think he's here. He's on. A, he's texting. Hey, Roman Legion, what's going on? I got your text, man. I'm sorry I didn't get back to you yet. Um, great guitar player. Sounding killer. Working his butt off. Um, all right, you got Jeff. You got the, the Kushman NYC. Love the stream. Thanks, guys. Um, David is David Gilmore often out of tune at live shows. Yes. Yes. You know, I mean, I'm not going to go any any negative way on David Gilmore, but check him out live, you know? There's some times where you're like, hmm, you know, hmm, what's going on? Um, okay. Oh, yeah, merch. I should probably have a, a, a cap, like, on merch, right? <laughs> I do have good headgear. That's pretty funny. Is this your favorite guitar now? Yes, this is my absolute favorite guitar now. It's weird how these things happen. Um... This guitar is, you know, I, I never thought that, that I was looking for a guitar that covered. All right, um, I'll just talk about this for a minute. It's a Mike Landau uh, custom uh, master build, like one of 18. Um, it was at a store um, that uh, I worked, I have friends with over called um, Watchtower Guitars. And um, this is the one I was playing over at Watchtower. Yeah, yeah. And it was not inexpensive, but the, I didn't, you know, I traded my Klon, no more Klon, and uh, some other stuff. And it's okay, like, you know, because these things come down to, you know, it's like anything. People will throw, like, an asking price for something, and that, that's not, that's what they're just asking. It's not what they're going to get. So you can, the great thing about guitar worlds and a lot of how I, I've talked about this in other streams, um, uh, trading is a great way to get into stuff, you know, like you just, I'd much I'd give away three guitars for one amazing guitar, no question about it. Sometimes a guitar just speaks to you. And you're like, man, I, this is just great. You know, like I just this, this guitar makes me want to play guitar. And the first time I picked this one up, I was like, I need to. I love this guitar. And I, I go, went to the store a fair amount because um, I had to be in Morristown, New Jersey. Um, my, my mom was in the hospital there, and um, so to take a break from being there, I went and played this guitar a bunch and I played about four or five different occasions and I just kept on picking up going Ugh. and so you know I had to get a sacrifice for it but it turned out to be really really quite a spectacular guitar um it's um now you guys know I, I'm, lo I'm a huge Mike Landau fan but um that's not why I got it I got it because it's a great guitar so it just kind of cleans up great. I don't know. But it's just, just a great sounding instrument, really clear and uh, resonant, and just a guitar that really spoke to me. And I was surprised at how I actually, how much it became, how quickly it became my main guitar. And the first thing I pick up, I mean, this is, you know, you sometimes you cycle through some of the guitars, but this one I've been really, really into. So um, I like that. Edward Sanchez, the shining moments can result with greater regularity. Yeah. Um, you just, you gotta just keep on playing. Like, that's it. Like, nothing's gonna happen without you working your butt off. That's really it. And I go through these stages. You guys have noticed this on your own. I'm sure you're practicing a lot and you're like feeling really good and then life gets in the way and you end up kind of dropping off and then you come back to it 
and you're like, oh, wow, it really makes a difference if I practice. <laughs> like, these are, I know these are ridiculously obvious things, but um, I'm still reminded of it all the time. So I try to practice every day for that reason, just even physically to keep it going, but to keep everything flowing. Um, all right, so once again, I'm going to, uh, just uh, as BB was kind of floating over there too, I've got two things on sale. If you don't have them, I've got the guitar reference guide 15% off. I'm talking about Dorian scales and D7 arpeggios and stuff. It's all in the book. Um, and also my blues rock masters, the British edition with Jeff Beck, Eric Clapton, uh, David Gilmore, and uh, Jimmy Page. It's kind of, if you guys don't have that, that's 40% off over at the link there if you want to do that. It's a great way to help out the channel and to help me out and all that. I know all you guys have this stuff, but if you don't, run on over and do that. Um, okay, what are your thoughts on Gibson Tribute Les Paul for an entry Gibson, I, or the Epiphone Les Pauls? Oh, Steve Moore, I have one and it's a great guitar. I, I don't really know. Um, I haven't tried those, but I, I really feel like the later Gibsons in the past, um, well, I know the Murphy Lab stuff has gotten really great. It's really great. Um, and I think across the line, I think the whole line across the board has gotten much, much better. So I think um, you're going to do all right with that. Also, uh, if you ever think about resale value on these things, if you want to trade up, as I was discussing before, off brands are never going to get you the trade up value that you would want. So if you have, if you buy uh, anything that says Gibson on it, you'll get more money for it than if you get, get something that says, I can't say Ibanez is an off-brand, but, you know, like, or ESP or something like that. Not saying those aren't good guitars, because they are. They don't get the same resale. Just like a PRS doesn't get the same resale as a Fender or Gibson. Just doesn't, you know, in the market. The only two companies that seem like really get the resale, if you're thinking about that, is Fender and Gibson. Um, as, I'm not saying that that's their best... Um, their best guitars are the best guitars out there. Um, uh, they're just that that's uh, that's just the, the facts. Fender Gibson always have the resale value. It's like amps too. Marshall Fender. You know some of the not the boutique stuff's a different market. Like you know um, uh, something like you know uh, two rocks and things like that always kind of hold their value, but. I got three P. I got three. I have three PRS cores, and I need to get rid of one. I got a Santrantha ret Retro DGT Twenty Two Semi Hollow. What is your suggestion? Um, the I love the DGT. I have one. Um, actually, my friend borrowed it because he's thinking about getting one. Um, and I have a Five Ninety Four, both of which I really, really love. But the DGT. It's got all this stuff all together on it, you know, uh, the, the big frets. It's got, I love the way it feels in the right hand because David designed it. The bridge is kind of a little more recessed, so it feels like you're playing a Telecaster or a Strat. It's been really kind of cool. Keith's been on here. You've also been texting and blowing up my text here. And so I'm on the screen and your texts keep on popping up. <laughs> um, and I know that your new Epiphones are doing pretty well, to, or, or, or sound pretty good. Um, so back to the PRS, I would probably I would look for the the DGT. I love those. You got the tremolo on it. Um, I don't know. That's great. And like I said, I do have the five ninety four here. Um, which actually, at the moment, I have tuned down a whole step. Sounds a little out of tune right now, but yeah, it's tuned down a whole step at the moment. Uh, it's a great guitar. I mean, it's nice and light. I just put in the uh, Fishman Fluence. They sent me over a set of the pickups. Sounds pretty cool. I'm tuned down a whole step, which um, I'm going to do a video on. Just give you. I watched the uh, Credence Clearwater Revival on that, that the documentary on on um, on Netflix and totally watch it because it's just so badass at Royal Albert Hall. And John Fogarty uh, changed this from his Gretsch, no, his, his uh, uh, Rickenbacker. Then when he goes to his black custom Les Paul, it's tuned down a whole step. So like Bad Moon Rise and all that stuff, like it's got that. <laughs> so 
So, you know, Bad Moon Rising's in D, but he's got, he plays it like he's in E and tunes the guitar down a whole step. A uh, few tunes on that. So anything in that video, which I highly recommend, when he switches to the Black, the black Beauty, he's tuned down a whole step. Um, it's pretty cool. Uh, and somebody said they want to hear the 335. All right. Be saying the custom amps, right? So that's a solid state tone. Um, and this one, you know, uh, 64 Murphy Lab reissue. I've always wanted the Clapton guitar because you guys know I'm a Clapton nut. And uh, just I found a good one. The price was right. Flipped a bunch of things. Everything's always kind of a stretch or a sacrifice for the good guitars. You sometimes you just got to do it, and then you're done. And that's the cool thing. You just kind of get one. There are two really, you know, one of each, as Keith and I talked about, I don't know how many guitars you need. But, you know, the ones that for me are really iconic, Strats, Les Pauls, um, 335. And then the clap, the, 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 um, the Landau comes from my roots of being like a, a, growing up playing metal and hard rock. And something that I was little, I love playing Strats, and you know, I've got my old Strat. Sometimes that neck pickup on a Strat becomes very Stratty sounding, like you're playing a Stratocaster, not that that's a bad thing. But I wanted something a little different that didn't necessarily sound like just a Stratocaster. I say just, but you know what I mean. That sound is so ubiquitous that it's awesome, you know. But um, am I making a video of the most music for the least gear? Uh, I don't think that would be the case. Yeah, we want one of each, though. Um, let me see what we got going on here. Um, go. Yeah, the, 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 the 335 is great. I mean, they're so different. I mean, it's really cool. Now you see why I bought it, right? This, some of them got it. Um, is that a Nashville bridge? Uh, I don't know, man. I don't know what they call this thing. I'm terrible at that. It's just the, uh, what's the difference between Nashville and the ABR? I think it's the ABR. But it's the... Um, Nylon saddles. I, I tried putting a different bridge on it, you know, because um, I'm a lunatic. This is like uh, the bridge from my Murphy Gold Top that I put an actual 1964 bridge on. Um, and um, I actually think I kind of prefer the sound of the nylon saddles, a little more mellower uh, in, a, in a way that I, that I found pleasing to my ear. So um, I, I like that a lot. All right, so... Um, just to kind of recap some of what I was talking about off the top, you can go back and watch. If you check out my video that I had done on two things guitar players must know, it's really about just giving yourself time to be creative and uh, giving yourself time to make mistakes and try not to edit while you're doing things. And working on an idea and just letting it, letting it ride, you know what I mean? Like just work, play through something if you come across an idea, whether it's melodic, like if I saw that loop, is that my loop here? I think so. Am I in tune with this loop? I am. Yeah. And I followed that melodic phrase, that rhythmic idea. I'm gonna make a mistake if I can. It doesn't sound ridiculous. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna make that work. Well. Right, so I'm gonna spend some time. It's like, how to get that sound? Like, 
Like, I don't know what I'm, I mean, I do know what I'm playing. If I, I can analyze all that, but. Right, if I just start, well, that's a, I'm trying to just play chromatically. Is it important that I know that I am playing a flat five, a flat six? And all? Yes, 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 of course it is. But at this point, I'm just improvising and letting my ears kind of take me. So if I know if I'm on a situation where I jam and I accidentally hit something that's wrong, quotation marks wrong, right? I'm gonna try to actually make, make it work. I'm going to play a chromatic scale, right? Good. Okay, so now I'm going to kind of make some music with that. You know, it's kind of messing around with that chromatic scale to see how I can make some creative music with it. And I do that with pretty much every concept or anything I'm going to play over. I start to explore, explore what it is that are the possibilities. And like I said, yeah, I've been playing a really long time. I have a larger well to draw upon. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't work on the same thing at a, at a simpler level. Like if you're playing over this and you want to work on blues licks that feel good, you know. you sell it it's fine for the most part all right guys uh, i want to thank everybody who has been here and hanging out with me on this stuff um oh jeff do you just do you, is the key to remembering what you discovered repetition yeah absolutely yeah you got to just beat the crap out of it for sure for sure for sure for sure um you have to just repeat it over and over again because how else are you going to remember it right you just have to really work on on memorizing it or what happens is you keep on repeating ideas and after a little while um, it starts to become your own thing you don't end up spending as much time it's a language once you start to figure out how to use the word uh, I remember my, a good friend of mine uses the word apotheosis a lot and I was like what? I'm like oh so looked it up and now I can use it in the sentence Let's see, but I'm not going to all right, guys, thanks so much for being here. Um, once again, as BV has been so awesome in helping out today, as always, um, Blues Rock Masters course, 40% off, the guitar, survival, the guitar reference guide, which, of course, uh, you can see a lot of stuff that I'm talking about today in terms of scales and fingerings and arpeggios, etc. cetera. Um, but the main thing is just to have fun. And remember that uh, you got to... The best players are the ones who practice being creative and work on these things. The people who develop their own voice. This is how you develop your own voice. This is, this is it. You just play, and you'll start sounding like yourself. Um, okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I really appreciate everybody being here, as always. Um, also, you know, all my, my, my past master classes are over at my jam guitar lessons. I'm going to be having two more this month. And you sign up for YouTube freebies and you'll get on my mailing list about everything that comes out too. And um, yeah, lots of good stuff coming up. All right, guys, thanks so much. And I will see you, uh, I'm going to do next week as well. I'll see you guys next week. <laughs>